Hi, everyone, and welcome. This is Deborah Schaefer Seaman, Rob Sox Network Weaver. I am joined today by Avram Infeld, who's uh, sitting in Jerusalem. Today is May 5th, 2016, and it is 12 noon Eastern, Yom HaShoah. I want to introduce you first to Avram Infeld and then pass the mic over to him for the fourth and final uh, learning opportunity in Rav Sachs' Torah Lishma, Learning for Learning's Sake series. So Avram Infeld was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, which you will learn quickly when he opens his mouth to tell us some spectacular stories, as he always does. He was raised in a strongly Zionist family. Uh, to two Jewish educators and was the first student in the first Jewish day school in Johannesburg, which was the King David School. Um, he made Aliyah to uh, Israel and in 1970s, following his shlichut in Baltimore, established an organization called Melitz, which is a nonprofit educational institution that works with Israel and diaspora young people to foster Jewish identity rooted in pluralistic understanding of Jewish life and the centrality of Israel. So a true partner organization to the work that we do at Rav Sach. Avram also served as the chairman of Arivim, the founding chairman of San Francisco Federation's Amutot program in Israel, the director general of the Shalom Hartman Institute and chairman of the board of Israel Experience uh, through the Jewish agency. Avram was central to the founding of Tadlit's Birthright Israel and served as its first director and uh, traveled to many, many university campuses on behalf of Hillel, um, where later he was appointed the international president until September of 2006. So I can tell you a whole lot more about Avram Infeld, but what I will tell you is that he is um, a true mensch, a kind soul, and uh, a mentor and a, a champion of the Jewish people. So Avram, with that, I will pass the mic over to you and invite you to learn with us. Thank you very much, Deborah. Hearing your introduction was enough reason for me to be on the call. You know more <laughs> about me than I imagined, but I'll get to the subject. This morning at 10 a.m., the air raid sirens throughout Israel went off. Not because, God forbid, there was an attack on Israel. But while the air raid sirens were going off for two minutes, the entire country stood at attention, doing something very, very strange, commemorating an event that never happened in Israel. I know of another, no other example in the world where a nation state commemorates or celebrates an event that happened somewhere else. For me, there is no greater expression of Israel being a Jewish state than the way in which it expresses Yom HaShoah as a part of the national holiday system in Israel. Not because it happened in this country, not because it happened to Israelis, but because on this day we commemorate the loss of one third of the Jewish people. To me, that identification, that commemoration, is a proud acclamation of Israel being a Jewish state, and we'll talk about that word a little bit later. But you know that in our calendars, we Jews have a habit not of concentrating on single days, but of concentrating on periods. You have the three weeks which tied Shiva Sabbath Tammuz to the ninth of Av. You have Rosh Hashanah tied to Yom Kippur by the 10 days of awe. You have Pesach tied to Shavuot by the period of Sirat Omer that we are now in. In the same way, we can talk about Israel and Yom HaAtzmaut. You have to begin the discussion on Yom HaAtzmaut, Israel's Independence Day, on this day that I just described and that we are commemorating today on Yom HaShoah. Because the sirens that went off today are going to go off next week, in eight days, as a matter of fact. The sirens are going to off, go off again, and this time, the entire country is going to stand twice, once in the evening and once in the morning, at attention, remembering those who gave their life for the state of Israel, for the defense of the state of Israel. 
It's a very different kind of sadness than you feel on Yom HaShoah. You can ask kids in the streets, how many people are we commemorating, how many people's deaths are we commemorating on Yom HaShoah? And you'll automatically get the number six million. But you ask young people today, can you name one? Did you know one? Did you know of any? It's very, very unlikely that they'll be able to do so. But on Yom HaZikaron, it's a much deeper sense of personal, personal loss. Because you can go to any kid and ask them how many people's deaths are we commemorating on this day? And they won't have an answer for you. Because it's a number that hasn't stopped and was different yesterday than it is today. You ask them if they knew of anyone and you won't find anybody who who will not know a cousin, a neighbor, an uncle, a brother, a parent, or God forbid, a child who lost their life, who gave their lives in defense of this country. It's a day of real sadness. You know that the buses going to cemeteries around Israel are free. You don't pay. They're a service of the, it's a public service offered to people to go up to the military graves. It's a deep sadness. You feel it in the air. I mean, Israeli drivers don't honk their horns on Yom Hazikaron. We have no Memorial Day sales in this country. It's a true day of mourning. But something very strange happens. Just because the clock moves to 8 p.m. on Yom Hazikaron, all of a sudden, people are dancing in the streets, banging each other on their head with plastic hammers, rejoicing with a joy that is hard to describe. It's almost schizophrenic what's expected of us to move from a day of deep mourning, of deep sadness, to a day of real joy. There were many who suggested that we separate Yom mode from Yom Zikaron because it is so difficult to make that move. And it was David Ben-Gurion who gave the answer and insisted that they be one day after the other, saying that when you put Yom Zikaron and Yom mode today together and you're able at 8 p.m. to move from sadness into dancing, it's a sign that you value what you received for the price that you paid. And what is it he said that we received on that day? We received the promise that that which we commemorated a week ago on Yom HaShoah will never happen again. In my own lifetime when I was a kid, the noun that went along with the adjective Jewish more than any other noun, and this was before the creation of the State of Israel, was the noun refugee. We, the Jewish people, were a family of refugees. Today, there is no such animal as a Jewish refugee for the simple reason that the State of Israel exists. The State of Israel is more than just a state. And that's what I want to try to study with you today. Unfortunately, one of the texts that I thought was sent in, out in advance got lost on the way somewhere. And I, it was two stories by Shai Agnon. Israel is a phenomena. And like all phenomena, there are master stories that help you understand this phenomena. One of the master stories is very beautifully told in a, in a, it appears in the first time actually in the Talmud, but was translated and forbessed and improved by Shai Agnon. Shai Agnon was the only, the only Israeli who ever received the Nobel Prize for Literature. He is without a doubt the poet laureate of the State of Israel. His books are amazing. To my mind, if you want to test whether one is an educated Jew, is to see on how many different levels he can understand a story by Agnon. 
he opens the world of Jewish excitement and being at so many different levels. His books cover an entire shelf in my bookcase. Shai Agnon gets a Nobel Prize, goes to Scandinavia, comes to the ceremony. It's a Shabbat morning. He doesn't travel on Shabbat. He's 80 something years old. He walks to the ceremony. He gets up. He's given a scroll and a check. He tells them, I don't carry on Shabbat. Can you please let me deliver this to me after Shabbat? And then he goes to sit down and somebody said, Mr. Agnon, you're supposed to make a speech. He said, oh, I forgot. But actually, I'm not a speech maker. I'm a storyteller. And I want to tell you a story. It's a story called Maaseha Ez, in which Agnon tells the story of a man who groaned from his heart. And the doctors prescribed that he go out and get himself a goat so they could have fresh goat milk every day. So he bought a goat and the strangest thing happened. Every few days, the goat used to disappear. And whenever it reappeared, its udders were filled with this milk that had the taste of honey. And the father wanted to know, where is it that this goat goes? What is it that the goat eats and drinks? Where does he find it? So he called his son and he said to his son, could you possibly follow the goat and see where it goes? And the story goes on to say that the son tied a leash. And the word for leash in Ivrit is meshicha, little with a letter chaf. Agnon does not make spelling mistakes, but he wrote the letter, the word Mashiach with a letter chet from the word Mashiach. And he said that he sees that his son has tied the Mashiach to the, to the neck of the goat. And that very day, the goat got up and pulled on the leash and woke up the son who followed the goat. And they went out into the fields and suddenly there appeared a cave and the goat and the son went into their cave. They knew not how long they were there, whether they for two days or two weeks or two months. But when they came out on the other side, they saw beautiful hilly land was covered with grass and hundreds and hundreds of boxer trees growing. And the son watched as the goat lapped up that water in the streams and ate of the box of food. He lay down in the sun. He knew not how long was he there for two days or two months. But suddenly the goat turned and wanted to go back into the cave. And the man stood up to follow the goat. And suddenly he saw three men in the distance and he wanted to know where he was. So he went up to these men and said, who are you and where am I? And they said, you are in the land of Israel. You are near the city of Tzfat. And as is our, it is Friday evening. And as is our custom, on Friday evening, we go out into the fields to welcome the Shabbat, the Shabbat queen, Malkata Shabbat, Shabbat Malka. And the son said, oh my God, it's almost the Shabbat. I can't follow the goat. What am I going to do? My father's waiting. And he wrote a note to his father and put the note in the goat's ear, knowing that whenever his father saw, saw the goat, he would pet the goat's head and the goat would shake his head. He knew that this would happen again when the father saw the goat. And he knew that when the goat shook its head, the note would fall out. Fall out. He wrote to his father, he said, my father, I have come to the land of Israel. The place you always spoke to me of as your destiny, as our destiny. Dad, grab the leash, grab the Meshicha, and follow the goat. It will bring you to your salvation. And he sent the goat into the cave and he went off to pray. At the other end, there was a father waiting for his son. And the cave suddenly opened and out came the goat alone. 
And the father felt a way that Jacob must have felt when the brothers came home without Joseph. And he cried, Woe unto me! Where is my son? Ha'im chaya ra'a achalatu has an evil beast devoured him. And he was so perturbed that he forgot to put the goat's head. And the note never fell out. And as time passed, every time the father saw the goat, he became more and more distraught. He couldn't take it anymore. He called the butcher, the shochet. He had the shochet kill the goat. And when they skinned the goat, the note fell out. And the father again said, woe unto me. With my own hand, not petting the goat, I ruined my chances for salvation. And then he turned to the king in Scandinavia and said to him, I am a member of the first generation that found its way back into the cave. I now live in the city of Jerusalem. That story is without a doubt one of the master stories of the Jews, Jewish people and its relationship to the land of Israel. The state of Israel cannot have meaning if that story is not a part of understanding what Israel is. Israel, the land of Israel and its centrality to the Jewish people and to our dreams to return to our land. But there is a second master story about Israel. And this most master story takes place 250 years ago. You see, these same Jews who had left Egypt and had signed the covenant with God at Mount Sinai, and where God had promised to take them into the land of Israel and to look after them and to give them rain in the right season. And they had committed themselves to keeping his commandments. Did not keep his commandments, despite the fact that God fulfilled his promise to take them into their land. And they sinned. And mipnei chata'enu galinu me'artsenu. And we were exiled from our land. And every Jew throughout that period said to themselves, we are being punished. We are living in exile. This is not a permanent situation. Therefore, our role in life is to keep ourselves distinct as a people, which is why Jews lived in ghettos. Not because the non-Jew forced us into ghettos, but because he wanted to live with our people. We kept God's commandments and we hoped and prayed that one day God would forgive us. And then about 250 years ago, suddenly this Jew who's been living for well over 1800 years in the ghetto, waiting for this promise of salvation to be fulfilled, suddenly meets up with modernity. And all of a sudden, the Jews in the ghetto begin to hear sounds from outside, including a statement which says to them, stop being different, become one of us. And the Jew has to respond to that invitation. We Jews today are totally not uniform because different Jews gave different responses to the invitation, become one of us. The Haredi world said no. The assimilation world said yes. The religious world said, well, I'll do it partially. I'll become a part of your nations, but I will be Jewish by my religion. But a fourth group created another master story about Israel. And they said, Mr. Nonju, I cannot become one of you, but I am willing to become just like you. You have an anthem. You have a flag. You have a state. That's the way I'm going to be a Jew. I'm not going to become an Englishman like you or a Frenchman like you. I'm going to become Jewish the way you are English or French. And what they did 
was they applied to the state of to the Jewish people the laws of modern nationalism that were just developing in Europe. And that was modern Zionism that brought about the creation of the current state of Israel. It was that state that when Ben Gurion announced its independence, he did not say, I hereby declare the creation of the state of Israel, but he made the statement, I hereby declare the creation of a Jewish state to be known as Israel. What the heck could he have possibly meant when he said a Jewish state? What he meant was, yes, in this world of modern nationalism, we are going to lead the Jewish world into becoming a nation. We are going to provide a national identity to the Jewish people. We are going to apply the laws of modern nationalism to the Jewish people. So when any of you or your classes talk about Israel and visit Israel, hear about Israel on the news or read about it in the newspaper, what Israel are we talking to them about? What is Israel? Is it the platform on which God is fulfilling his promise to his people? to bring them back to the land of Israel? Or is this the state in which the Jewish people are applying to themselves the laws of modern nationalism? You cannot understand Israel. You cannot understand our legal documents. You cannot understand our declaration of independence if you don't understand those two master stories. The master story of the land, which is the land of our salvation. And the second is the land, the state, which is the fulfillment of our desire to become a modern nation. To read a newspaper properly in Israel is almost like reading a page of Talmud. You look at the person who wrote the article in the paper, you have to say to him, yourself, before you can answer, understand the article, where does he come from? Is he from the school of those where Israel is reshit smichat gulatenu, the beginning of our redemption? Or is Israel the state in which we are applying the laws of modern nationalism to the Jewish people? It affects everything we do and we say in this country. Some of you may remember, not so long ago, the Israeli government sending soldiers to Aza to take the Jews out of Aza when we were about to return that territory to, to the Palestinians. It was an amazingly horrible sight of where these two stories came to a clash. Very often they live with each other. Very often they struggle to live with each other. But sometimes they clash. The Israeli government sends people, sends an army, a tool of modern nationalism to take settlers out of the land of Israel who believe that they are there because of story number one. What a clash between these two stories. But the clash impacts on us, even in our declaration of independence. And I would like, if I can, to look at a page of the text that I asked to prepare for us to talk about. We'll share that with you now. Sally, can you put the page two up on the screen for us, please? Can everybody read that? I can't, so I'm gonna ask you to read it. My eyesight is terrible. I'm going to ask someone to begin to read. Can I hear someone do it? Anne, will you read that for us? Anne, will you start us off? And let me, let, let me Anne, warn you in advance. I'm going to interrupt it. you. Okay, I'm going to unmute you, Anne. Anne, I'm having trouble unmuting you. Okay. Oh, there we go. Go ahead. According... 
Accordingly, we members of the People's Council, representatives of the Jewish community of Eretz Yisrael and the Zionist movement, are here assembled on the day of the virtue of our national and historic right and on the strength of our resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Yisrael to be known as the State of Israel. He did not say, I hereby declare the State of Israel. He made it quite clear. And there was a major debate. This is a document, there's a lot of time was spent and negotiated on how to write it. A state, we hereby declare the creation of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the state of Israel. Avraham, I've lost audio. And I'm back, I'm back. Okay, perfect. Go ahead. What were the reasons that they gave that legitimized the creation of the State of Israel? We are here assembled on the day of the virtue of what? Of our national, of our natural and historic right. What is that? What were they referring to? Story number one. And on the strength of, our, of, our, of the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly. For some of the Jews who we are, and we're preparing a document declaring our independence, you could not possibly do this without referring to our natural, our national, natural and historic right, God's promise to the Jewish people. But for others involved in the creation of the state of Israel, you couldn't ignore the fact that we turned to the body of nations, the United Nations, and asked them for recognition. Without that, you couldn't justify the creation of the state of Israel. So right here, you see the beginning of an attempt to unite the two master stories together. Can we go on? Can we see the text? Coming right up. Read on, whoever was reading so well. That was Anne. The state of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles. Stop. It will foster the country for stop. all its inhabitants. Stop, stop. It will be open for Jewish immigration. What's Jewish immigration? Moving Jews from there to here. And for the ingathering of the exiles. What's the ingathering of the exiles? Moving Jews from there to here. Why did they have to say it twice? Why did both have to appear in this Declaration of Independence? Because if you wanted to unite the Jewish people behind this creation, you had to include both master stories. It is so evident there. Go on. It will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. All its inhabitants. How many Arabs would today sign that agreement that the ben this country was to the benefit of all of its inhabitants? There would be some, but not most. If we look at the world today, we are hearing all over the place the creation of Israel was not for the benefit of all of its inhabitants. And it will be based on? Freedom, justice, and peace. As envisioned by justice and peace. Where does that come from? The prophets of Israel. Where did the freedom, justice, and peace statement come from? The French Revolution, the foundations of Western society, freedom, justice, and peace. They couldn't get away with that statement. They had to add, go on. 
as envisioned as envisioned Israel. It will not ensure complete freedom, not the freedom, justice, and peace of the French Revolution. We'll accept freedom, justice, and and and, and peace if you will add as envisaged by the prophets of Israel. Once again, an attempt to live with both stories, freedom, justice, and peace of the, of the West, and the promises and the values of the prophets of Israel had to be included into one sentence. There is a dramatic result. This, this document is a dramatic result of a negotiation between these two master stories, trying to find a way of giving a meaning that is acceptable to the Jewish people about the land, about the state of Israel. Go on. It will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. It will, it will guarantee the whole complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion. Didn't we just say this was a Jewish state? How can they get away with a statement like that? This is a Jewish state, but we're guaranteeing to equality to all people. You know why they did that? And there was agreement on that? Because to those who signed this document, there was a clear understanding that Judaism was not a religion. That's another one of the Western creations, that Judaism is a religion. But to both the secular and the religious in Israel, Judaism was the culture of the people. And there was no, no clash between the state of the Jewish people and total equality to all religions. And by the way, just as an offside, I think you should understand this. I don't know where you people teach, but you should be fair to recognize that there is only one religion that does not have freedom of religion in Israel. All peoples have absolute and total freedom of religion in Israel, other than the Jews. Jews are the only people who do not have freedom of religion in Israel. Some of us may like that fact, some of us may dislike that fact, but only orthodoxy is recognized in Israel as the religious interpretation that is accepted in this country. A former rabbi cannot perform a wedding, a burial, a religious ceremony. It's very interesting that we could put on the word that we accept freedom of religion because freedom of religion referred to others. When we are a Jewish state, the Jewish applies to the Jews in Israel, their culture demands of them a particular interpretation of that religion. So you can see once again how this document is an attempt to negotiate and struggle with different interpretations of what Israel could and should be like. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. And now this is very interesting. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions, and it will be faithful to the Charter of the United Nations. Once again, this paragraph ends with religions and nations. What are the Jews? Who are we? It's still a debate within the Jewish people. I recall very well my first visit to the United States of America, driving down the New Jersey Turnpike towards Baltimore, Maryland, seeing a sign on the road which said, a sign on the road which said, families who pray together stay together. This sign is sponsored by the Council of Protestants, Catholics, and Jews. 
And I could not understand what Jews were doing on that signpost. Because coming from the education that I had received and living for so long in Israel, it never entered my mind to define the Jews as a religion. They were much more a people. I thought the Israelis were wrong when they spoke of it as a nation. I knew that the Americans were wrong when they spoke of it as a religion, but it was definitely a membership in a people. And that debate affects many of the clashes in understanding of Israel. You have those who have demonstrations who want total pluralism, religious pluralism within Israel. And you have people who demonstrate against changing laws in Israel which may give recognition to non-Orthodox streams. This all draws from this basic clash that came out of the emancipation, out of this meeting between the Jewish people and modernity, which created a confusion in our identity and is essential to understand if you want to understand Israel. So we have looked at a document which was a declaratory document, a document that declared what Israel was, was, was meant to be, which gave the, spoke of the aspirations of the Jews who were living here. But I'd like to have a look at the laws and how this affected laws. If we follow on, I've taken a quote out of the law of return. The law of return is one of Israel's basic laws. We don't have a constitution, but we do have a set of basic laws. And the difference between a basic law and a regular law is that it takes a much higher number of people, a much larger percentage of people to change a basic law. You have to have a simple majority in order to change a regular law. To change a basic law, you need much more than a majority. And one of Israel's first basic laws is a simple, very simple law, which is five or six words in entire, entirety, and which says, every Jew is entitled to migrate to Israel. Sounds clear, right? Every Jew is entitled to migrate to Israel. By that law, any Jew who comes and says, I want to be in Israel, can be automatically become a citizen. Other people who come can also become citizens, but it will take them five years. They have to go through tests. They have to prove loyalty. But a Jew who arrives automatically becomes a citizen of this country. And that is drawn on this law, which says every Jew is entitled to migrate to Israel. Well, look at this. Let's look at that sentence. You all know what every means. You all know what entitled means. You all know what migrate means. You all know what, what to Israel means. There's a little word over there that is not very clear at all. The famous three letter word, Jew. Who are you referring to when you say every Jew is entitled to migrate to Israel? And it became a major, major issue in Israel. I want to tell you two stories, which I think it's important for educators to know. The one story is about a gentleman by the name of Father Daniel. Father Daniel used to be known as Oswald Rufheisen. He was born to a very Jewish German family. He became a Catholic out of personal belief. He became a Catholic priest. He became Father Daniel. And he moved to the Holy Land in order to run a monastery, the Stella Maris Monastery near Haifa. And after he'd been in Israel for several days, for several years, he applied for Israeli citizenship. And 
the clerk in the Ministry of Interior said to him, okay, you're entitled to get Israeli citizenship. You've already been here for five years. There have been no complaints against you. You can become an Israeli citizen. And his response was, no, I will not accept that citizenship. I want citizenship under the law of return. And the clerk says, well, what are you talking about? The law of return talks about Jews. And Brother Daniel says, I am a Jew. I'm born to a Jewish mother. I'm a member of the Jewish people. Well, why are you wearing that funny collar? He said, because I'm a Catholic priest. The clerk says, didn't you just say you were Jewish? Yes, I'm Jewish, but I'm a Catholic priest. And the clerk said, I'll call my advisor. And the advisor called their advisor. And it went on until it reached the civil court in the state of Israel. I mean, the Supreme Court in the state of Israel. Israel is a Supreme Court of nine judges. The president of the Supreme Court said, this cannot be heard by a single judge. At least three judges have to hear this case. And he appointed randomly three Supreme Court judges to hear this case. Now, accidentally, two of the Supreme Court judges happened to be Orthodox Jews. One happened to be a secular Jew. Three very well-known, highly respected. They could not reach an agreement of whether Brother Daniel was a Jew or not. Can we get back? Are we still over there? We're still there. Go ahead. I've muted the person's line. I apologize. I can go ahead and speak. Go ahead. What is amazing was that the two Orthodox Jews say said they could not reach a majority. The two Orthodox Jews reached the conclusion that he was a Jew. The secular Israeli writes in his decision, no, you are not a Jew. The moment you've taken upon yourself another religion, you have removed yourself from your people. Now, can you think of any other example where a sentence like that could be made? But taking upon yourself another people, you have removed yourself from your, but taking upon yourself another religion, you have removed yourself from your people. Wow. And then there was a second case. The second case dealt with a Captain Shalit, a captain in the Israeli army, who was a professional soldier devoting his entire life to the defense of the Jewish state. He also happened to have a very unique taste in certain types of women. And he fell in love with a Swedish volunteer. And he went to Sweden where they got married, had two children, and returned to the kibbutz. And he wanted to register his, ki his kids at the Ministry of Interior. When you get an identity card in Israel, you either have to say you are Jewish, Arab, or other is written on your identity card. Was written. That's been changed now. Jewish, Arab, or other. So he gets back the identity cards for his kids with the word other. He hit the ceiling. He said, what are you talking about? My kids are Jewish. They live in a kibbutz. Their father devotes his entire life to the defense of the state of Israel. How can you say my kids are not Jewish? Come to the kibbutz. Tell me how they are different from every other kid on the kibbutz. They know exactly as much or as little about being Jewish as anybody else on the kibbutz. The only festivals they celebrate are the Jewish festivals. The only language they speak is Hebrew. Of course they're Jewish. And this went to the court, the same Supreme Court or different uh, makeup of three Supreme Judges. 
And these three judges did something else. They turned to the Knesset and they said to the Knesset, you have an unclear law in your books. You have a word in your books that makes no sense. Every is entitled to migrate to Israel, we understand, but who were you referring to when you said the word Jew? And began an attempt to clarify the term every Jew. Can we get the text back? We're going to share the text up on the screen now. Sally? Avram, what number would you like us to look at? I'm looking at, I'm trying to find it on you know, the text myself. Sally, go up. 4B on the second page. Perfect, thank you. The Knesset went into debate, had serious discussions, and they came out with the other, with the next decision, which was, an amendment to this law which read, with respect to this law, remember the law is, every Jew is entitled to migrate to Israel. They're now clarifying the word Jew. With respect to this law, a Jew is one who was born to a Jewish mother or converted to Judaism and is not a member of another religion. This or this and this. You are born to a Jewish mother or you converted to Judaism and you are not a member of another religion. Wow, they solved the problem. They took care of Brother Daniel. They took care of Captain Shalit. But this led to a much bigger fight which is still going on in the country. What's wrong with that 4B? What's the problem in that statement? There's again an unclear statement there. An unclear word. What the heck do you mean by convert? And from the moment that this law, this amendment was passed, the Lubavitcher Rebbe began a battle in order to add to this law three simple words. Convert according to halacha. And ever since then, we've had five attempts that have brought, been brought to the Knesset to add those words to this law. None of them have passed. The law remains the way it is today. There is still no clarification of the issue. There is still debate. But there are two things that I want to say before I open up this to questions. And The two issues that came out of that are number one, we have an Israeli Knesset which has rejected the change in the law. But the last time it was brought up, the change was rejected by five votes in a, in a Knesset in which there were nine Arab members of the Knesset. So how do I know that this is a Jewish state? Because an Arab determined who is a Jew. Wow. Immediately after that began a discussion. Should Arabs be allowed to vote on these issues? Well, they're citizens of the country. But this is an internal Jewish issue. You can't separate law from law. There's no other country in the world in which such issues are discussed and which make life so excitingly Jewish. I thank you for listening to me and I'll be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Okay, so Avraham Infeld, thank you for that incredibly inspiring talk, learning the text of the Israeli Declaration 
of independence and love return together with you. Anybody who'd like to jump in for um, conversation is invited to unmute their line. Avraham, my chat box is filling with tremendous accolades uh, for your talk right now. My, my chat box is literally going crazy with people um, gushing. Uh, so I invite you all to unmute your line or send me a chat uh, and I'll unmute it for you to jump in with questions or conversation. I'd love to start with um, any Miles Jewish Day School because I know that they have a room full of folks. So I'm going to unmute their microphone and let them jump into the conversation. So Sherry Krell, your line is unmuted. Um, I'm going to... Just, I'm just unmuting. It's easier to talk. Thank you Hi. very much. It was fabulous. So many things to think about. So the one thing, I mean, I guess it's the, the next point of what you're talking about is um, bringing in the conversation of um, conservative reform or different Jewish voices into that conversation. The debate is very hot now. The issue of reform and conservative Jews having a place at the holiest site of the Jewish people, the Wailing Wall, can they pray there? And there have been attempts that have not yet been fully finalized to make it possible because the opposition is extreme. So the Jewish discussion of who is a Jew and what is a Jew and how do you Jew and Jew as, an, as a verb is very much a part of this country, which to my mind says, Jews, you can't disengage. You can disagree. You can enter the fight. You can take sides, but you can't disengage because what's going on over here affects the future of every single Jew and the way they interpret their being Jewish. Abraham, I would love to jump in on that last thought. Um, uh, the Rav Sack and four other um, national and international Jewish day school organizations, Pardes, the Reform Day School Network, Schechter, the Conservative Day School Network, um, YU, uh, Yeshiva University School Partnership, and the Partnership for Excellence in Jewish Education have all announced a coming together. Uh, to create one tremendous national and international Jewish Day School umbrella organization going forward. You are one of the few people in the world today, in the Jewish world today, who understands what it means to lead the Jewish people uh, together in our multiplicity and in, in, in our multiplicity of voices. The talk that you just gave was all about that. What words of inspiration do you have for the folks sitting here and, and the folks listening to this recording as we go forward and attempt this, let's work with all Jews in all Jewish day schools uh, in these current organizations? I would say, learn to live with a distinction between two things, uniformity and unity. And every time you stand before a decision, you have to ask yourself, does this celebrate our lack of uniformity? And does it add to our chances for unity? You will work together when you look to find ways in which you have to celebrate the lack of uniformity. You can't cry about it. You have to offer alternatives to it. We are not uniform. It's not our fault. The secular Jew is a product of five generations ago making a decision of a different kind of being Jewish. So are the other interpretations of non-Orthodox Judaism. As a matter of fact, even Orthodox Judaism is very much a different interpretation of what it once was. We have to struggle very hard. That is why I, I, I jumped with joy when I heard of this rough suck move, because it is going to create for me and for Israel 
a diaspora partner that we can talk to because you'll be going through the same issues that a Jewish state is going to be. My great-grandfather dreamt of a Jewish state, but he dreamt of a state and in his mind, everybody who came to the state would look just like every other person in his shtibble. That's not what happened. Different kinds of Jews came to the state. Different kinds of Jews make up the American Jewish community. We can't survive without unity. And we will never succeed in being unified if we always struggle for uniformity. Celebrating a lack of uniformity is a first step towards building unity. Beautiful, thank you. I see that somebody's called in from Toronto. Would you like to jump in or Gregory or Hannah, would you guys like to jump in to the conversation? You can unmute your line to do that. Somebody called what? From Toronto. Okay, Avraham. Um, I am noticing that we are at a three minute marker. Do you have um, any final thoughts to share with us? Anything to summarize? Um, wisdom to leave us with as we move and transition in these, uh, the other nine days in the Jewish calendar? When I speak to Israelis about these nine days, I never fail to talk to them also about the necessity that they relate seriously to the parallel 10 days of all, not of we, but the 10 days of all, which are Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. You cannot separate the red letter days of the Jewish calendar. These are what make me Jewish and these are not mine. You have to struggle to include both. I'm striving for the day when the Israeli will relate seriously to the 10 days of all and the diaspora Jew would relate seriously to the nine days of a week. It's almost the same word. There's just an A missing. 10 days of all and nine days of we. Thank you, Deborah. It's great seeing you. It is wonderful to see you as always, Avram Infeld. What an inspiring talk. We can't thank you enough for joining us, for giving of your time on this solemn day in the Jewish calendar uh, and in the Jewish year to share words of inspiration for all of us as we move forward as a we for the Jewish people, for the Jewish culture, uh, and for our students first and foremost. So thank you all for joining us. This has been Avram Infeld's Torah Lishma, Learning for the Sake of Learning, and Yom HaShoah. Avram, thank you. Wishing you only the best. Much Hatzlacha and good health going forward. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. And thanks so much to you all for next week's Yom HaShoah. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone.